What is up, guys? It's John with pewpewtactical.com, and nothing has changed for the umpteenth week in a row. Everything is still exactly the same. We are still in the bunker, and in all honesty, the novelty has completely worn off. April was a quantum blur of a month that simultaneously feels like it happened within a day, but also that day was 3,000 years ago. And the more I read the batshit insane headlines that Pandemic Hellworld continues to produce, the more I'm convinced that life on this planet actually ended in 2012. And what we're experiencing is the world's shittiest simulation being run on a mid-2000s entry-level Dell laptop that hasn't been restarted in eight years. Some Texas boog boys got their cosplay cards pulled by the thick arm of the law in one of the funniest photo series I've seen in quite some time. People whose intelligence I generally had a decent opinion of are posting Charlie Day tier corkboard 5G anti-vax conspiracy theories. The world's shittiest private military company apparently tried to overthrow the Venezuelan government armed with airsoft guns, Elon Musk's child's name is an alphanumeric clusterfuck such that even kids named Daenerys are going to get away with bullying him, Jeff Bezos is building a 10,000 year clock inside of a mountain because we don't even get cool villains in this timeline, and my inbox grows ever more swollen with emails from brands seeking to assure me that now, more than ever in these trying times, I am welcome to purchase their products. But I'm doing well, I'm, I'm doing well, how, how are you? Crazy person opening monologues aside, today I did want to walk you through uh, the project that has been eating up the vast majority of my time since you have seen me last, and that is Maglock. Now, I've wanted to put some work into this thing for a long time, considering that outside of the sites, it was completely stock. And since I have been using the Mantis X app and doing a shit ton of dry fire training, I now am at that point where I feel comfortable kind of identifying a few pieces that I wanted to change out. And with any luck, once I'm able to actually get it out to the range, I am not going to regret these changes. But that's why you save your OEM parts. First things first, I finally got around to stippling my grip. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the process per se. Uh, there are a ton of other people, uh, especially on YouTube, who have done much more comprehensive and much cleaner and prettier jobs than I have, but I am pretty happy with it nonetheless. For the unfamiliar, stippling is the process by which you use something like a soldering iron, or in my case, uh, a relatively inexpensive wood burning tool uh, to add a little bit of extra grip texture to your handgun frame assuming you have a polymer handgun. Now there are a ton of different ways that you can go about this, and some of the more high-speed services that people offer, as in you send in your frame and a company will stipple it for you, are eons, light years beyond uh, what I'm capable of doing here. Like I said, in my case, I used a wood burning tool with a relatively fine tip to create a pattern of repeating small holes in the grip itself. Now, obviously when you're applying heat to plastic, it's going to melt and create a little bit of bubbling and that bubbling is not going to be smooth. Repeat that process a few thousand times and hopefully by the end, you are going to have a surface that when gripped is gonna grab the skin of your hand that much better. And like I said, my work is not the cleanest, largely owing to the fact that I don't really have uh, straight edges that I can use to mark off lines really well at my disposal at the moment, so unfortunately no Reddit karma farming for me, but I am still pretty happy with it. Now you can get real wild with uh, Glock frame modifications, and Gen 3 Glocks in particular are a little bit slippery. That stock texture just doesn't really do it for me. However, I chose to refrain from getting into some of the scarier territory, such as sanding off all of the finger grooves, which is another popular modification, or doing the double trigger guard undercut. Uh, that one, because I don't have a Dremel at the moment, but I'm also a little bit wary of making all of these wild ass changes to my gun um, without firing it in any of this in-between period, so a little bit at a time, and hopefully when I get it out to the range, I enjoy everything that I have done to it thus far, and if I feel the need to make those further modifications moving forward, I probably will. As you can see, there is stippling texture further forward on the frame as well, and that's intended to give my offhand a little bit of extra purchase, as my grip does ride pretty high, and that's naturally where my thumb falls. There are actually some pretty cool mods that, again, I'm not going to get into quite yet, 
uh, that wind up turning this area of the frame into a little bit of a shelf. So in addition to texture, you've also got a bit of a ledge to grab onto as well. Speaking of high grips, I've got a CAGWORK slide release on the gun now, which essentially replaces the OEM slide release and gets it up and out of the way. If you uh, also have a tendency to grip your guns pretty high up, you are probably familiar with uh, that being a thing that can prevent your slide from locking back on an empty mag, and uh, this essentially prevents that. It's really nice. Right below that, I've got a Zev oversized mag release. Again, another drop-in part that replaces the Glock OEM mag release and allows me to drop mags without coming up and off of the target or losing my sight picture. Uh, with that stock release, I would kind of have to cant the gun to one side to adequately hit that mag release with my thumb, and now, I don't, but it does the job and I do think it is a pretty substantial improvement over that OEM mag release. That about covers the externals, but I have installed a few different internal upgrades as well. You've probably noticed, but I do have an Apex enhanced Glock trigger and trigger bar in here, and it's paired with a Ghost Ink three and a half pound trigger connector, which all together just uh, really cuts down on that trigger take up, gives a much cleaner break and a much smoother reset as well. Stock Glocks are sort of infamous for that really mushy trigger pull, and altogether, uh, this setup really mitigates a ton of that. It's never going to be as clean or crisp as something like a 1911, obviously. This is sort of just what you have to deal with with polymer striker-fired pistols, um, but I am pretty happy with the setup, again, without having tested it. <laughs> if you are sitting out there maybe a little bit intimidated or on the fence about permanently modifying your polymer-framed pistol, I get it but it's a super functional mod, it's relatively easy, and there are a ton of guides out there, so I would say go for it. Up next is a pretty cool little holster and biometric safe combo sent to us by Vara Safety, and it's called The Reach. The Reach uses an electronic locking mechanism to grab and secure your gun's trigger guard once inserted, and once it's been set up and programmed, allows you to retrieve your GAT piece via an integral thumbprint scanner. The Reach is designed to be mounted to a hard surface, such as a heavy piece of wooden furniture, underneath a desk, etc., with the idea being that you've got a secure platform to store your handgun that can either be overt or discreet, while giving you access at a moment's notice. This also now means that I'm a single 30-something-year-old dude with a handgun holster safe thing mounted to my bed frame. So, how's it work? Honestly, it's pretty decent, but I do have a few gripes. I do like the idea a lot, as I feel like it walks this real thin line between security and accessibility. However, the thumbprint scanner can be pretty particular about the angle that it wants your thumb to hit it from. Even after following the instructions that have you roll your thumb across the thumbprint scanner to get all of the nooks and crannies on the edge of your thumb itself. Though I don't think I'm doing anything wrong here, it does appear to work best if you come down straight on top of the scanner with the center of your thumb, as the reach did fail to release my Glock a handful of times if maybe my thumb came in a little bit too fast or at an angle that it didn't really seem to like. I don't think I have to tell you that that is a little bit concerning, especially compounded in a situation where you might need to access the gun in an emergency, where your body's flooded with adrenaline and you are suffering some sort of fine motor loss as a result. The absolute last thing that I would want in that situation is to be sitting there trying to figure out where, where gun? Why no gun? Though, it does appear to work pretty reliably once you sort of have the hang of it, and in all honesty, it might just be another piece of kit or gear that you kind of need to practice with to get the hang of to make sure that it is going to work and you're going to be able to access your handgun when it really counts. Once the thumbprint scanner detects your thumbprint successfully, it's going to activate the little locking mechanism, and it pops the gun out of the holster and up into your hand a bit. It also comes with a set of keys so that you can bypass the lock manually if you need to for whatever reason. The Reach also utilizes a hard plastic shell for the holster portion, which is what actually locks down your firearm. And the shell can detach from the body of the unit itself and be swapped for a different gun's shell if you find yourself needing to switch what GAT it houses at any given time. Although the lock is powered and the unit needs to be near an outlet, it does retain its hold on the gun even while disconnected and with a dead battery. I should mention, however, that as of right now, there's no solution or support for guns that might have lights and lasers attached attached to them, as they straight up don't fit in the holster shell. And in all honesty, that's a little bit of a bummer, 
I'd actually use this thing pretty regularly if there was a way to keep my stream light on there, but that seems pretty easily fixable should Vara choose to offer light compatible shells in the future, so fingers crossed. Stock guns don't really seem like they're going to have any problems fitting, at least none that I can see, but now that I've gotten a bit spurglord about my Glock, the Zev mag release actually prevents the gun from locking correctly unless you depress it such that you can't actually have a mag locked into the gun itself. Again, fully aware of the fact that my idiot Spaceman Glock is probably not what a lot of folks are going to be mounting and locking into a reach, but it's worth mentioning all the same. Overall, I dig the idea of the reach itself, and if the polymer shells were a bit more accommodating of aftermarket parts, this thing would probably have a pretty solid recommendation from me. But if you've got a more or less stock gun and want to keep it somewhere safe, but perhaps slightly easier to get to than the inside of a traditional gun safe, decide for yourself, give the reach a look. Alright guys, that's going to do it for us today, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the content, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel, and if you have any kind of ideas of things that you would like me to take a look at while I'm still doing all of this, uh, please feel free to let me know in the comments section below. Once again, my name is John with Pew Pew Tactical, we will see you next time. My neighbor is just absolutely bumping Hendrix right now, which I'm not complaining about. But...